Okay, the first concept that we need to talk about is this uh, concept of membrane potentials. So a membrane potential is simply the separation of charges across a cell membrane. Now, if you're, if you're not really familiar about what happens with cell membranes, I'd really encourage you to go back to your cell biology notes, particularly you know, chapters 7 and 8 in your old cell biology textbook, Beckner's World of the Cell, and then also go back and look at the cell biology notes on the cell membrane structure and function. That will really help you just kind of brush up on that, and that's going to help you kind of come along in understanding what we're doing here with membrane potentials, and then further go on to look at what happens overall generally in nerve cells, which has a lot to do with what's happening on the membrane. We have this separation of charges across this cell membrane. This is what a membrane potential is, and it's called a potential because the separation of charges has taken energy to create, and now it has the potential to do some work. So kind of, let's go ahead and take a look at this. So if you look at this right here, what we have is we have this in yellowish, this cell membrane, this bilipid membrane down the middle, and over here, we have the intracellular fluid on the right hand side and we have the extracellular fluid here on the left hand side. Let's just use that for convention. And if you look, let's just go ahead and, and count up these charges here, these little cartoons of charges. We have one, two, three, four, five positive charges on the outside, one, two, three, four, five negative charges, so that's balanced out there. And on the inside, we have the same thing, five of each. And so this is equal. We have plus zero on the outside, plus zero on the inside. There's no change here. There's no difference. And so there's no potential on this membrane. But let's just imagine here for a second that somehow we could pull a couple of these charges from the intracellular fluid into the extracellular fluid, kind of like that right there. And now what we have is, if we look at the positive charges, we have a plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and only 5 of the negative charges here. So what we have out here is plus 2 is our charge. On the inside here, we have these 5 negative charges, but only the 1, 2, 3 positive charges. So we actually have a minus 2 charge here. So if we're looking at the potential here, if we're measuring it, this is actually a potential of about negative for whatever units we're using here. Most of the time it's in millivolts, so I'll just go ahead and put millivolts here, because we have this excess of four more negative charges on the inside than we do on the outside. So that's essentially what's going on when we're looking at this membrane potential. The charges are unequal between the inside and the outside of this membrane. Now one thing to notice here is that most of your excess charges are excess charges of negative out here and positive in here in the intracellular fluid will aggregate along the cell membrane, which means that most of the rest of your extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid is actually electrically neutral all of these surplus charges aggregate, so it's only charged right next to the cell membrane. So that's something kind of to keep in mind as we're, we're thinking about this. How are these charges actually being created and, and, and used by the cell? It actually turns out that almost all of our charges are going to be carried by specific ions when we're talking about this happening in cells. So in particular, the primary ions that are being used on the positive side, we have sodium, which is a 1 plus or 1 positive charge ion, and then also potassium K, which is a 1 plus. On the other hand, the negative charges are largely carried by large negatively charged proteins that are in the intracellular fluid inside the cell. And these can't get in or out. They're trapped inside the cell. And so that's what's providing most of the negative charge that we have inside the cell. So what that means is the only small ions that we're using are both positively charged, most of what's happening by changing or moving around charges is going to be done by moving around these positive charges. Briefly, what we're talking about when we talk about measurement of potentials, first off, we're often measuring this in millivolts, and by convention, the sign is whatever excess charge you have on the inside of the membrane. So if you remember in that example we just did, we had more negative charges on the inside of the membrane, so it was a negative value there. And in nerve cells, 
the resting membrane brain potential in most nerve cells is about negative 70 millivolts. That doesn't mean much to you probably right now, but as we get going, uh, keep this in mind because this is going to be kind of a, a mile mark or a landmark that we're going to keep coming back to as we talk more and more about this. Okay, so what we have here is a model of what is going to be happening as we create this membrane potential. One thing to, to note here is that over here on the left-hand side, we have our intracellular fluid. Over here on the left-hand side, we have our extracellular fluid. And the primary thing that's going to be creating, one of the primary things that's going to be creating this, this membrane potential is this thing right here called a sodium-potassium ATPase. This is a pump that is going to pump sodium one way and potassium the other way, pumping three sodium outside the cell and two potassium inside the cell. And this is an ATPase. This actually takes work because we're pumping these ions against their concentration gradient. So one thing to notice is here in the extracellular fluid, our sodiums are a lot higher than in here in the intracellular fluid. So to pump these ions out of the cell, like this, pumping those out, and the potassium's in, this is going against your concentration gradient, this requires energy, and this actually uses one ATP for every cycle. So for every cycle of the sodium-potassium ATPase, three sodiums are moving out, two uh, potassiums are moving into the cell, and we're using one ATPase. One thing I want you to note here also is that we're moving three charges, three positive charges out, only two positive charges back in, so this is building up a negative potential on the inside of the cell because we're pumping out more positive charges than we're pumping back in. But this actually doesn't give us very much of a negative potential inside the cell. This sodium potassium ATPase only accounts for about negative three millivolts of potential. The next thing I want you to look at here is we have this thing up here, the sodium or the Na leak channel. This is a passive channel that only allows sodium through it, and it does that and allows it to flow back into the cell the opposite direction of which it just was pumped. We also have, if you look down here in the bottom in orange, we have this potassium leak channel as well, and this does the opposite. It allows potassium to leak back out of the cell that we just pumped back in. So these are passively allowing sodium potassium ions to move back down their concentration gradients back into for sodium and out of for potassium out of the cell. Now that might seem really strange and really counterintuitive. Why spend all this energy to separate these charges and let them just leak back the way that they're going? Well, with these potassium leak channels down here, the K leak channels, these are actually about 30 times more prevalent than this in nerve cells than these sodium leak channels. And so we get a lot of potassium moving back out of the cell for every sodium that's moving back in. Potassium leaking out of the cell is the principal driver that actually makes or creates potential, this uh, resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. So let's go ahead and kind of refresh ourselves on what different kinds of forces are going to be acting on these ions. So the first one is going to be concentration, these concentration gradients. Ions or anything, really any, any molecule is going to tend to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And really there's always a surplus of ions both on the inside and the outside of the extracellular and the intracellular fluid. So what this means is that relatively few ions going back in or out will have very big effects on the electrical potential of either side, but the concentrations aren't going to be disturbed. So as much of this sodium is pumped out or leaks back in, that's not drastically affecting the overall concentrations of sodium either inside the cell or outside the cell. And the same with potassium. This isn't disturbing those potentials or those concentrations very much at all. Sodium is always greater in the extracellular fluid. So the sodium concentration is always greater outside the cell. Potassium is always greater on the inside of the cell. And so these, again, pumping in or out is not going to greatly influence these concentrations. So that, that's going to stay pretty static no matter what we're doing to the cell in terms of creating these potentials. 
The other major force that we have acting on these on these ions is going to be electrical gradients. So remember that positive charges are going to tend to be attracted to negative charges and repulsed from other positive charges, exactly the opposite with negative charges. They're going to tend to be attracted to positive charges and repulsed from other negative charges. And so this is another force that is acting on all of these ions. So let's go ahead here and look at a special circumstance here just to kind of play a little scenario out and see what would happen. Here again we have this, this membrane here and we've taken away the sodium potassium ATPase so there's no pump and there's no sodium leak channel anymore. All we have is this potassium leak channel down here. Now what would happen? Let's think about the forces that are acting on all these potassium ions on either side. The concentration gradient is tending to want to push potassium outside the cell because we have far more of it on the inside of the cell than we do outside. However, if you look at the electrical gradient, that is going to want to push potassium back inside the cell because outside here, in the extracellular fluid, we have lots of positive charges, but very few negative charges. On the inside, we have these very large negatively charged proteins that are going to tend to attract those positive charges. So we have these two different forces pushing potassium in two different ways. It actually turns out in this case that the concentration gradient is stronger than the electrical gradient. So if we just had a potassium leak channel here, we would tend to get potassium leaking out of the cell, passively moving out of the cell. However, if we just let this go until it stabilized, it would not go until there was equal amounts of potassium inside and outside the cell membrane. It would actually balance out with far fewer potassium ions outside in the extracellular fluid than there will be potassium ions on the inside. And that's because we still have this draw of this electrical gradient pulling them back in. So even at equilibrium, there's going to be more potassium ions on the inside of the cell than on the outside. And if we were to look at this, what the polarization would be of this membrane, when this reached equilibrium, it would be right about negative 90 millivolts. Negative 90 millivolts, therefore, is what's known as the equilibrium potential of potassium, or that potential that's reached across this membrane when the concentration gradient and the electrical gradients even out so that there's no net movement of potassium in or out of the cell. They've stabilized. So we get this electrical gradient of negative 90 millivolts, and then we have this concentration gradient that has far more potassium on the inside of the cell than the outside, the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient are moving in opposite directions, balanced out at negative 90 millivolts. Well, that isn't the only thing happening. Uh, potassium isn't the only ion that's being work worked on here. We also have sodium being worked on as well. So let's look at the opposite situation here just for a moment. Let's look at a situation in which we only have our sodium leak channels. We've taken away again the sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, we've taken away the um, sodium pump or excuse me the potassium leak channel as well. And we just let this go to equilibrium so we would have some sodium moving in and again let's let's take a look at the forces that are working on this. We have a concentration gradient and that is moving them in and we have this electrical gradient as well and that's also moving in because again there's more positive charges out in the extracellular fluid than the intracellular fluid. We have more negative charges in the intracellular fluid so that's going to also draw sodium in. So here's what will happen. Sodium will continue to flow in this leak channel if we just let it go to equilibrium so it's normally at about negative whatever. If the sodium kept flowing in it would you know drop the electrical potential it would reach zero which would be electrically neutral. But then it would keep going because not only do we have an electrical gradient pushing this in, we also have a concentration gradient that's still pushing sodium into the cell. And so what would happen, let's mark all of this out, the equilibrium potential of sodium is about plus 60 millivolts. 
if we let sodium flow in to the cell until we reach equilibrium, the concentration gradient would actually push it to the point where there's more positive charges on the inside of the cell than neutral, actually to a positive, positive range here. And so what we have is we have both of these leak channels acting in helping set up this resting membrane potential. So let's look at this all together here for a second. Again, we have this net force of sodium wanting to leak in, potassium wanting to leak out. Now remember, as I said before, in nerve cells, this potassium is leaking out at a 30, approximately 30 times the rate that sodium is leaking in. But then we also have the sodium potassium ATPase that is pushing in, um, pulling in two potassium ions and pushing out or pumping out three sodium ions with every cycle. And this is requiring energy one more time, is using ATP all the way through that. And so when this is at rest, when the nerve cell is at rest, these forces, sodium leaking out, or sodium leaking into the intracellular fluid, potassium leaking into the extracellular fluid, and the sodium potassium ATPase working, works in a steady state. Or what that means is that these, these movements of ions are exactly balanced, or roughly balanced, so that the membrane potential stays at roughly negative 70 millivolts the entire time. And one more time, just to uh, elaborate, sodium potassium ATPase gives us about negative three millivolts excess charge on the inside here but it's mostly this potassium leak channels where potassium is leaking back out of the intracellular fluid into the extracellular fluid at relatively a lot higher rate than the the sodium taking these positive charges out that's the primary driver in giving us this negative 70 millivolts on the inside of the cell so let's just kind of look at what's happening there again we have the three sodium going out two potassium coming in, and then we have sodium leaking back in at a relatively low rate, and potassium that's leaking out at a relatively high rate. Okay, there's a couple more terms that we need to learn about before we move on to different kind of membrane and cell potentials. So let's go over these just real fast and we'll, we'll move on to graded and action potentials. The first of these terms is polarization. So this kind of like what we were talking about already with uh, membrane potentials. It's just the separation of charges across a plasma membrane. So a pretty simple term there. This is basically the same as what we're talking about with a potential. Also, we're going to be talking about depolarization. Depolarization is just a membrane becoming less polarized. So normally we're talking about membrane potentials being somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 70 millivolts. Oftentimes, these membrane potentials will go from about negative 70, and go more towards neutral um, polarization, which would be depolarization. And that's something we're going to talk about as well. And then also, the reestablishment of this polarization after depolarization is something known as repolarization, or just returning the membrane to its resting potential. Also something that can happen during changes in membrane polarization is called hyperpolarization, which is just the membrane becoming more polarized than what it was at its resting potential. So again, during our resting potential, oftentimes nerve cells have, or neurons have this resting membrane potential or polarization of negative 70 millivolts. If we're going beyond that to negative 80, negative 90 millivolts, that would be hyperpolarization. A couple more terms here. First off, the resistance is hindrance to the movement of electrical charge. So anytime that you have some material that resists the movement of electrical charge, this is going to be called resistance. And most materials have some sort of resistance. And to give you some examples, cell membranes tend to have very high resistance. You might remember that we have on the polar heads, we have these nonpolar tails. And so polar things such as ions have a really hard time getting through cell membranes. And this means that any charges, therefore, are going to have a hard time getting through cell membranes, and thus they have high resistance. It's only when we start having channels, such as sodium channels, potassium channels, things like that, do we start lowering the resistance for cell membranes. The intracellular fluids has very low resistance, so charges have a very easy time moving through the intracellular fluid. 
of cells. Also, current is known as the flow of electrical charges. So before in resistance, when I talked about resistance being the hindrance to electrical charge movement or electrical charge flow, we could have also called this the hindrance to current. So let's talk a little bit. Cell membranes have this very high resistance, and we can lower that actual resistance by giving the ions some way to get through these membranes. And let's talk a little bit about the ways that these ions can get through cell membranes. And the first is one that we've already talked about through active transport through these things called pumps. And one that we talked about specifically already is the sodium potassium ATPase. This is using ATP, therefore using energy to actively pump sodium potassium across the cell membranes against their concentration gradients. Another big way here is through passive channels, and these are often called leak channels. So there's no gate on these or that they're always open, they're non-gated, so ions can move passively, which means down their concentration or electrical gradients. Another one that we have, this is again passive, but we also have gated channels, some channels that have uh, that are sometimes closed and sometimes open, and so will only open under certain circumstances. And we have several different kinds of these. First off, we have voltage-gated channels. These will only open when they're in a specific voltage environment, as in when the voltage gets to be a certain uh, degree negative or a certain degree less negative or more positive, then these channels will open and allow whatever it is that they allow past be it sodium, potassium, whatever it is through. So we have these voltage-gated channels. We also have chemically-gated channels, and these are also called ligand-gated channels. And these will open when they uh, bind to some sort of chemical or some, which is also called a ligand something, that will be binding to these channels, and then they will open at that time. We also have mechanically-gated channels. These are going to be opening in response to usually some deformation of the cell in their brain or something like that. Some sort of mechanical change to the environment of that gated channel will cause these to open. And finally, the one, finally, the one that we're going to talk about are thermally gated channels that will, when the temperature changes or in a particular temperature or thermal environment, these channels will open. And so with that background, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about graded potentials. Now, grid potentials are just these local changes in membrane potential that occur in some varying strength or varying magnitude. So they're going to be changing the membrane potential, whatever it happens to be, in some local area. And these graded potentials, these changes in membrane potential, are started by some triggering event. We'll talk more about these triggering events and what they could be later on. But just kind of remember that there has to be some sort of triggering event that is going to go on and cause a change in the membrane potential. And the magnitude or how much that membrane potential changes is going to be proportional to the strength of the triggering event. So if you have a, of a stronger triggering event, you're going to have more change in the polarization of this membrane. And if you have a weaker triggering event, you're going to have less change in the, the polarization of the membrane. Now remember, this is specific to graded potentials. Also, graded potentials can either be depolarizing or hyperpolarizing. They can go in either direction. They can change this membrane potential either to make it more negative or less negative, one direction or the other. So they, they can operate in either direction. Now, keep in mind, when I give you examples for the rest of this short little presentation here, I'm going to be talking about depolarizing graded potentials. So here, let's go ahead and take a look at... Um, what could be happening here in a cell. What you're seeing here is uh, this right here is the intracellular fluid, the ICF of the of this cell. Also what we have here is the cell membrane. Okay, So what we have, this yellow in the middle on here is inside some cell, some hypothetical cell, and out here is the extracellular fluid or outside the cell. Also, you'll see this blue little thing right here. This sucker right here is going to be a some sort of channel, uh, perhaps a sodium channel, perhaps a potassium channel, wherever it happens to be. It's just going to be some sort of channel that's going to be opened in response to some, some event, some triggering event. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to go ahead and open that channel. And what's going to happen here is that you will see you'll have positive charges 
going down their electrical gradient to the inside of the cell. And what that is going to cause is this area right here in the middle has become depolarized. So we have this area of, of depolarization as these charges move to the interior of the cell down their electrical gradient depolarizes the cell. Now again this could happen the opposite direction as well depending on on uh, what happens. This, this could also be hyperpolarizing. And this is what's known as the active area. So this active area is the area in which um, this change in membrane potential is occurring. Okay. After that happens, right here where the active area was is neutral, but adjacent to it are still more negative areas. And that is going to tend to cause these positive charges to move towards that more negative area, which will cause propagation of this depolarized area down the cell, away from the initial active area. This active area will move away. And we'll also have, therefore, this um, change. We'll get positive charges on the inside, moving away from the active area, and then moving towards the former active area outside that area. And what this does is this is going to cause some propagation of this this depolarization away from the original active area, away from the site of the, the triggering event. And so these graded potentials will move across the cell membrane in this fashion. But here's the thing, we still have leak channels that are inside or in most of these cell membranes, and this will cause the loss of some of these positive charges or some of these ions back out of the cell again. And what this causes is a weakening of this depolarization or hyperpolarization as it may be as it moves away from their original active area. So what we would see here if you look up here towards the top of the screen if we were to measure the amount of depolarization at the initial active site we'd see uh, some particular amount of depolarization but as we continue to measure the movement of that depolarization as it moves across the cell membrane it dies out. It becomes weaker as we move a little bit further away. And if we're to measure even further away, it, this depolarization will become even weaker. And so this is what's known as passive conductance. We are these these charges are moving in a passive fashion away from the original active area. And there's ways that we can increase the distance that this passive conduction could move. The first one is that we could increase the membrane resistance. And what this would do is essentially we would be removing some of these leak channels so we're not losing nearly as many of these, uh, these ions as it moves away from the initial active area. That's one way that we could increase the rate of this. The other way that we could do this is to decrease the resistance of the intracellular fluid. So make it more able, these uh, charges more able to move through the intracellular fluid and do that at a rapid, more rapid pace, and that would also increase the distance of this passive type conduction. Now a couple things to take away from what we saw about these grab potentials is first off they're decremental, and that means they're dying out as they move along the cell membrane. So they're dying out generally over a very short distance, and so this the the strength of that potential change is not maintained as this moves across the membrane. The other thing is that we're going to be using these in a few places in the nervous system, some that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Okay, moving on now from graded potentials, we're now going to talk a little bit about action potentials. Now, action potentials are really kind of the the bread and butter of what the nervous system is doing. So this, these are going to come up a lot throughout the rest of us talking about the nervous system. So action potentials are these quick, large changes in membrane potential. They're happening very quickly, and, and there are ways that they, they differ from graded potentials. Number one, they're non-decremental. This means that they're not losing magnitude as they travel along the membrane. They're maintaining the same magnitude as they travel along. So this is a big difference between action potentials and graded potentials. The next one is that they are really all or nothing. Either action potentials happen or they don't happen. 
there's not going to be, well, it was a small action potential or it's a big action potential. Either an action potential occurred or it didn't. And this will happen when the, the cell membrane reaches what's called threshold potential. So there will be a small change, some triggering event that will change the action or the potential of the membrane to threshold potential. And if you remember, resting potential was right around negative 70 millivolts. Well, threshold potential is usually, not always, but usually around negative 50 millivolts. And so this threshold potential, if the membrane potential in an area of a nervous or a neuron membrane that can undergo an action potential, generally if it reaches as high as 50 millivolts, it'll undergo an action potential. Also, the duration and the magnitude of these action potentials are generally very consistent. It's not, again, it's all or nothing. It's not, it's not going to be half of an action potential or two times of an action potential. It's going to be the exact same thing. So let's go ahead and take a look here at a couple of the, the things that are really important to know about before we start talking about action potentials. The first one is these voltage-gated sodium channels. Now, so this is a cartoon here of a voltage-gated sodium channel. What you would normally have is this would be in a bilipid membrane like this. So you would have your phospholipids in here. And the top here would be the extracellular fluid here. And inside on the lower end, you would have your intracellular fluid. Now, there's a couple points on this that you need to know. A couple things that are important to know about when we start talking about these voltage-gated sodium channels. This one right now is in the closed, excuse me, closed conformation. So there's two different parts. There's right here, this part right here. This is called the activation gate. Also, we have this, this must be an E right there. Activation gate, there we go. And then this sucker, this little ball over here is called the inactivation gate. the inactivation gate. There we go. So this confirmation right here is closed because this activation gate right up here is, is closed. No sodium can get through. It would not be able to get through here because this activation gate is closed. However, this inactivation gate is open. When it's in its closed confirmation, it would come up and stick in the, the pore of the, the gate right up here like this. So when you have a voltage in this membrane uh, that is of appropriate, usually around threshold potential, negative 50 millivolts, this, this type of channel will generally go from this closed conformation to this. This is the open conformation. In this conformation, the sodium would be able to pass through from the ECF into the intracellular fluid just fine. And that's what happens. However, there is a timed event when these open that also essentially starts a countdown to a point when this inactivation gate is going to swing up here and close, like that. And so in this, this confirmation is closed and cannot be opened. until, cannot be opened until this inactivation gate resets back down here. At that time, this should be closed again. So this, from this point, this voltage gate would go back to this confirmation. Again, this is the closed confirmation here. Okay, so we have these sodium channels. They can be closed, they can be open, and they can be closed and cannot be open when the inactivation gate is closed or unable to be open. We have another kind of voltage-gated channel that we need to talk about, and that one is these voltage-gated tassing channels. And again, this is just a, um, just a cartoon of one right here. Again, this would be in a bilipid membrane like this. Whoa. 
And so this would allow potassium from the ECF out here to pass into the ICF, the intracellular fluid in here when they're open, but not in this case right here. That would pass out. And they they can open and allow potassium through. Now one thing to notice about these, there is no inactivation gate. They are either open or they are closed, and that's it. And again, these are voltage gated, so these are going to be opening in response to some particular voltage. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at what is actually going on in a cell during a membrane potential, or a, excuse me, an action potential. Down here at the bottom, what you're seeing in this pink is some sort of interior of some cell. So what we have down here is the intracellular fluid on the inside of the cell here, and then the black is the extracellular fluid there. And this lighter pink right through here is going to be the cell membrane. Up here on top, what we have here is in blue, we have these sodium channels. In orange, like we just talked about, we have potassium channels. So let's just go ahead and review really quick what's going on with the, the electrical and chemical gradients that we have for, for sodium and potassium. So if you remember what's happening right off right now is sodium, the elect or the concentration gradient is pushing sodium inside or tending to want to put sodium on the inside. However, if we think about the electrical gradient of sodium, it's actually doing the same thing. It's wanting to tend to push sodium inside the cell. Now, if we think a little bit about, now I'm going to go down here to the bottom, the potassium concentration gradient, that's tending to push potassium outside the cell because we have more potassium inside the cell than inside, so it's going to want to tend to push potassium in. However, the potassium electrical gradient is tending to push potassium inside because potassium is positive. And the inside of the cell, as you remember from when we were talking earlier about membrane potentials, tends to be slightly negative, where it's positive mostly on the outside, is wanting to tend to push potassium inside the cell. So kind of keep those gradients in mind as we start talking about what's going on during these membrane action potentials. Up here on top, what I'm going to be showing you up here is just a graph looking at what's happening at the membrane potential over time as we show the changes that are going on. Here in red, this is actually the actual membrane potential that we're tracking. In green here, this is just marking the threshold potential. So kind of keep that in mind that that is threshold potential right there and we'll take a look at what's happening at that over time okay so let's take a look what would happen is initially we'd have some sort of triggering triggering event and we'll talk more about what triggering events kind of can happen in a little bit but we'll have some triggering event up here that's going to bring membrane potential at this left hand side of this membrane up to threshold and what that is going to do is take a look at the sodium channel on the left hand most side it's going to open that sodium channel now opening that sodium channel remember we have this electrical and chemical gradient of sodium wanting to push sodium inside the cell and so passively sodium is going to tend to rush into the cell now take a look up here right above that that is going to depolarize this membrane and not just depolarize it is going to push it past neutral polarity and actually make this cell, uh, the interior of this, slightly positive. Now remember, this is both because we have both electrical gradients pushing sodium in, but then also concentration gradients that will push more than just what your electrical gradient would initially push in. So this is going to go ahead and push in sodium into there, causing this rapid increase in the polarity or in, in the in charge inside the cell. Now go ahead and take a look at this middle graph right here. What you're seeing right here is this is also now going to come up to threshold because these sodium ions, once they get in here, are going to want to actually move through the cell. They're going to move away from, because this has become slightly positive right near this, its electrical gradient is going to want to push these sodium ions away from this initial active site where sodium rushed in. So that is going to cause a slight depolarization in the membrane around the active site 
where sodium just rushed in. So keep that in mind that that's going to rush, or that's going to bring this adjacent area of the cell membrane up to threshold potential as well. I'm going to ignore that for the moment. We're going to just start looking at what happens now at this exact same site here. So the next thing that's going to happen, take, keep your eye right here on this inactivation gate. This is a timed event that this sodium channel is only going to stay open for so long. As soon as it reaches threshold, it's going to open, but a timer is essentially ticking down to this inactivation gate swinging closed. This is a slow action of reaching threshold. Another slow action of reaching threshold is going to be this potassium channel opening up and allowing potassium to rush out. So those two things happen. This inactivation gate swing shut is going to prevent sodium from continuing to rush in. Now think about what's happening with the potassium. Before, the electrical gradient was tending to push potassium into the cell, but now inside the cell in this location, we're actually positive. So now our electrical gradient and our potassium concentration gradient are both tending to want to push potassium out of the cell. So we're going to get this rapid flux of potassium pushing outside the cell. And that is going to, if you look up here at this graph, repolarize this cell, bringing it back down, actually slightly hyperpolarizing, pushing the polarization past where it was at resting slightly. After that, we have closing of this potassium channel and closing and resetting of this sodium channel. And that's going to let sodium potassium pumps, which I'm not showing here, but restore right here, restore the hyperpolarization back to resting polarization because it's going to be restoring the original concentration gradients. Now, if you look over here in this adjacent area, just off here to the right, I've been ignoring this for the moment, but as all of this that I was just talking about over here in the original active site went on, what's going to happen here is the exact same thing. We're going to have sodium rushing in again, down both its electrical and concentration gradients, depolarizing this, this area of the cell and actually pushing it past neutral and all the way up uh, slightly positive. That is then these slow events are going to happen swinging shut of the activation gate and opening of the potassium gate all the while the very next ones down this is this has reached polarization in adjacent areas again so off here to the extreme rightmost area of this this illustration here where we're just talking about again potassium now is going to rush out the uh, the cell down this electrical gradient for the time being because remember now the cell is slightly positively polarized and down's concentration gradient. So that rushes out, bringing back down the potential or uh, making it, the membrane potential more negative again, slightly hyperpolarizing it until that closes. And again, this happens that, again, in the next adjacent area, sodium rushes in, polar, uh, depolarizing the cell. The inactivation gate closes. The sodium channels open, sodium, or excuse me, potassium channels open, potassium rushes out, repolarizing the membrane. And so that occurs all the way down in adjacent areas. So what you have is this chain reaction. As one area reaches threshold, it causes this positive feedback loop, in which you have this explosive depolarization. As the sodium channels open, sodium rushes in. And that sodium now is going to diffuse somewhat through the cell and bring to threshold areas of the membrane that are adjacent to the areas that just went, causing those to depolarize as well and causing a propagation of this action potential. Now, one thing to notice here is as this depolarization happens, the sodium now rushes in and diffuses along the places that just depolarize over here behind it this inactivation gate is closed and that's going to prevent this action potential from moving backwards moving through the area it just went so this inactivation gate then inactivates these sodium channels for a small time after they open is going to prevent these action potentials from moving two directions both backwards and forwards it keeps them only moving forwards so let's take a really quick look at what this would happen again very quickly so Sodium rushes in, 
prevents more sodium from uh, entering as the inactivation gate closes. And then we have potassium rushing out, repolarizing the membrane, and this propagates along the membrane. Okay, so just summing this up. Reaching threshold potential is going to initiate three events, and one of these events is going to be fast, and a couple of these events is going to be slow. And the first one, the fast event that's going to happen once this membrane reaches uh, threshold potential is going to be the opening of these sodium channel activation gates. So these sodium channels are going to open up, and that's a very quick response and going to allow sodium to rush in. But then we have these two slow events that are going to be happening as well. That's going to be closing of the sodium channel inactivation gates. So that's going to close and that's going to happen automatically. This is just a timed event that happens after sodium reaches that that level or the, the threshold reaches is reached. And then also we have opening of these potassium channel activation gates. This is going to open these potassium channels and allow potassium to rush back out of the cell, repolarizing the membrane couple more thoughts is that this inactivation gate is going to create a refractory period. There's going to be some period after an action potential has occurred in an area of a membrane that is going to be more difficult for the same stimulus to cause another action potential because the sodium channels have been closed. And this does this really nice thing of preventing this backward flow of action potentials once it's already past an area of a membrane, it can't come back through that way for a particular amount of time. Now, there's two types of refractory periods, or two phases of the refractory period that we talked about, an absolute refractory period, where no amount of stimulus is going to cause another action potential. That's because all of the sodium channels are inactive. Their inactivation gate has been swung shut, and there's nothing that can happen that will, will start it up again. However, as those start to reset, we have this relative refractory period as well, where an increased amount of stimulus will cause an action potential, but takes an increased amount of stimulus. And that's because as these sodium channels begin to reset, they're not all going to reset at exactly the same time. We're going to have some of them resetting a little bit sooner than some of the other ones. And therefore, as part of the sodium channels are reset, a, a larger stimulus will be able to cause an action potential but it's not back to a fully reset stage. Also, one interesting thing we need to talk about is just a little bit about neural coding. And action potentials, like we were talking about just a little while ago, these are all or nothing events. And going to have essentially the same magnitude every time they fire. This is unlike graded potentials. But a lot of the stimulus that we, we get are not going to be all or nothing. They're always, they're going to have some magnitude, some degree to them. And so how in the world can the nervous system distinguish between these different levels of stimulus? And what it turns out is it's not with the magnitude of action potentials, but we're actually coding the strength of the stimulus by frequency of action potentials. So the more frequent that action potentials occur in some sort of like a neuron or something like that, is going to, to directly relate to the magnitude of that stimulus. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, and particularly also in lab, we're going to come back to that as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about neural coding later on.